everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. Every week, a new speaker joins us to share a bit of inspiration, creativity, and tips on how you can improve your photography experience. Upcoming presentations can be found on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to my YouTube channel and our community blog. My guest tonight is Ernesto Ruiz. Ernesto's work has been exhibited in galleries and in local businesses in his home state of Minnesota. As a writer, his articles on photography have been published in many local and international publications. In 2018, in collaboration with other photographers, Ernesto launched the Slow Photography Movement, an effort that focuses on the quality of photographic experience and creating meaningful connections to a place. In tonight's presentation, Behind the Slow Photography Movement, Ernesto will discuss what motivated him to start this initiative, what the group is hoping to accomplish, and how being part of a community of like-minded photographers has impacted his personal approach. Ernesto, welcome to the Happiness Hour. Thanks for having me. Yay! Okay, so we discussed this before we started. Um, you're going to pronounce your name because I we all know that I cannot roll R, so go for it. Ernesto Ruiz, if that's in Spanish, I'm fine with Ernesto Ruiz, you know, however you want to say, that's good. All right, so before you get started, um, I just kind of glossed over your uh, bio, so if there's something that you'd like to add or tell us a little bit about how you got started in photography, this would be a great opportunity for you to do that. Well, you know, so I am an architect, um, and so photography is really one of my hobbies, and it, I've kind of have made a little business out of it, but it's really something that I do for fun. Uh, and it's something that I really enjoyed doing uh, in the 1990s when I was in architecture school. Uh, I had a, a, you know, a 35 millimeter camera, I had a couple and a few lenses and I love to play around with it. And I gave it up, but I came back to it in 2015 and have uh, been uh, kind of passionately pursuing this again uh, in, in digital format now. So I do it for fun. Uh, and I have, I'm a person of many hobbies, you know, so I'm an architect and I also, I love photography. I, I love dancing. My wife and I make dancing and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So. So you're a true artist. <laughs> well, I, you know, <laughs> I, I enjoy doing things and, and, you know, whether they are art or not, then, you know, it's really for others to decide. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen your photography. It's art. So, um, all right, let's, let's get started. So everybody else can get a, an introduction to your work. Okay, so um, so I am from Puerto Rico. I, uh, I live in Minnesota now in the Twin Cities. And, you know, the I do want to touch on the slow photography movement today. That's something that I started in 2018. And uh, Jennifer Renwick and Beth Young are my collaborators on that. And we have been working really hard to launch that and we don't yeah so the slow photography movement is not something we've monetized it's something that we really we do for fun and we've done a couple of podcasts uh jennifer beth and i on this uh with matt payne and david johnson um but so today is a little bit different because i want to share more of my own personal experience in photography uh since 20 you know january 2015 when i bought my digital dslr and i jumped right into it uh i went through a couple of phases of of development that I want to go through and then really kind of got somehow a little demotivated and I was kind of losing interest, getting burned out. And that's where the slow photography movement initiative really, really happened. And that's kind of changed my approach. So that's kind of the process that I want to go through today. So as I've outlined here, I'll talk about my photography before SPM. That's what we call slow photography movement and to keep it short. Um, and what I call phase one uh, gear and technique. That's what I was doing for the first year and a half. Uh, then uh, Wanderlust when we just got into traveling and I'll talk about how I was burned out and then launching the slow photography movement and why, and then how it's impacted my work. So that's, that's the gist of it. But, you know, before I go, I get really into it. I wanted to share this funny photo. So I found this in my, 
well, somewhere, and this is probably circa 1992, uh, me with my first camera, uh, Canon EOS Rebel S, probably. You can see with a pop-up flash and everything. And I was probably setting up a timer for a family portrait. So um, in 2015, when I bought uh, my camera, like I said, I live in the Twin Cities, and I was mainly shooting uh, local. And you know, my first instinct, instinct was to go shoot all the big landscapes in the Twin Cities. It's like, you're gonna check them off. So I went to the Stone Arch Bridge, which is on the screen here, and other really well-known locations. And there's nothing wrong with that. I wanna say that when I talk about my, the phases of photography, I don't wanna say that I've gotten better. I wanna say that my interests have shifted, okay? And there's nothing wrong with doing uh, whatever I was doing at any of these phases. Um, but, you know, in this first part of my journey, uh, I was really cycling through equipment like crazy. I mean, I'm telling you, because there's a hobby, I was buying and selling lenses like every other week. And I was reading reviews and obsessing over gear and, and you know, pixel peeping and figuring out, you know, technicalities and all these things. Um, and I was really kind of focusing on learning technique. And a lot of the time I found myself really doing more work almost because I could. So, you know, if I, it was, if I wasn't bracketing an image or focus stacking or doing something fancy, uh, I felt like I wasn't really proving something or doing something of value. I felt like, you know, I was really kind of driven by that technical component. And I really spent a lot of that time chasing the icons locally and chasing sunrises and sunsets, which honestly I do not do a spoiler much anymore, but that's something that I did uh, a lot in the day. So uh, that previous image was Minneapolis. It's still my best-selling image. Uh, some of my older work still sells best. Uh, but you know, some of these other images, this is my where I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. Again, kind of trying to be opportunistic and chasing storm and, and, and finding a moment that was really going to be impactful. And the State Fair in Minnesota is a... Um, you know, is, is, is known nationwide. It's, I think it's like the biggest. So documenting the state fair and, and in this case, playing with tilt chip lenses. So I, I got myself a couple of tilt chip lenses so that I didn't have to distort images, you know, and keep vertical lines uh, uh, straight. I'm an architect, so I think I see kind of composition in a very kind of architectural way, even if I'm shooting nature. So in this case, you know, keeping all the vertical lines straight by shooting with a tilt chip lens allowed me to do this effect and, and, and have an image that I was really happy with. And I was doing a lot of cityscapes, which eventually I did kind of lose interest in, but again, shooting close to home, I, I, this is where I lived. So I was shooting a lot of uh, sunset dusk images where I was maybe blending exposures like the sunset exposure and I would wait for the lights to come on and then I would kind of blend those two exposures that would capture maybe half an hour apart into one image. Um, but I was also starting to get interested in nature and hitting some of those places in Minnesota. Minnesota is not really Utah. It's not a place of big epic landscapes, but there's this beauty to it. There's a lot of beautiful places. And I was finding those places and going to them to, to photograph. So this was a hike up to Palisade Head on Lake Superior at like 4 a.m. in the dark to capture, to capture sunrise there. Um, Split Rock Lighthouse, I think everybody uh, here is probably familiar with. And, um, this is one of those experiences where I got up, you know, at 4 a.m. and it was like negative 30 degrees. I'm not kidding. Uh, and my car broke down, a cylinder started misfiring, my tripod broke when I extended it, but I, I somehow uh, made it there and, and made the shot happen with the kind of the sea mist uh, racing, rising from the lake because of the cold. So, you know, probably pretty familiar to most people. You start doing photography, you start feeling like, you know, everybody's got a sort of split rock. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to go to this place. I'm going to go to this place. And I'm going to get all these places of, of, of uh, images of places that are uh, recognizable and that people really um, love and that will sell. Because honestly, that was one of the things that was drawing my photography a lot in those first days was I started doing art shows within the first year and started to get a sense for what are the kind of images that people really like to buy. And, and, and that was something that was really informing what I shot. So uh, this is an image that I still love. It's, uh, it's from one of those early morning sunrises in Split Rock Lighthouse State Park in negative 20, 30 degrees, uh, seeing the sun uh, come up. 
So that's kind of uh, what I was doing at the same time. Uh, I don't really show these images. I don't think anybody outside of friends or maybe the people that followed me in the first month or two of my photography has seen this, but I was doing portraits as well. So I was, I had bought some soft boxes and umbrellas and I was uh, using flash photography and diffusers to photograph friends. So in, in these uh, shots, I had set up, you know, three or four remote flash units and I was playing with how to manipulate light and kind of uh, getting a sense for how those things work, which are, really technical skills, but I really eventually did inform my photography in terms of, you know, how I think about life. And, uh, and I'll, you know, uh, circle back to this later, because even though I don't do portraits anymore, um, I, I did them very briefly. Some of what I learned here, I think that impact my development later on. So within the first year, I started doing art shows and that was a blast. I mean, because I honestly, you know, the first one I did, I was, I have been doing photography for maybe a year. And, and, you know, when you jump into something, or at least I know when I jump into something, the first couple of years are just intense. So I, I was just doing photography like all the time. And the picture on my right was me doing my first art show. You can see the stone arch images behind me there. Uh, and some of those other uh, cityscape and landscape shots. But what I really found doing those art shows was, uh, uh, the connection that you could make with people uh, was really valuable. And sure, it, it was, it's very fun to sell images. It's very fun to have that reward of somebody like willing to part with their money to, to take one of your, your images home. But ultimately it was kind of the, it was really the conversations that you had with people about the images that were really, really rewarding and really, uh, 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 um, really made me enjoy the show more than the business side of it. So I did keep doing business shows and you know, I used to do the, these kind of really a lot of images of a lot of smaller and frame prints and so on and so forth. The one in the middle is, was a more recent show and you can see how I, I was kind of simplifying my display to just like three large images or something like that. Um, but again, this is something that really uh, started to, where I started realizing that for me, making connections, getting to know people and having conversations about the content and the background of an image is really important instead of just kind of showing, showing a pretty image and, and not being able to connect with people about it. So then in 2016, in the summer, we went to Iceland uh, and we rented a camper van and we did the whole ring road and we did that in 10 days and a yellow camper van that had clouds painted on it. And it was, you know, uh, uh, quite the experience. And that really changed my perspective dramatically. I mean, after that Iceland trip, we went to Iceland two more times in the next two years. We ended up going to New Zealand and suddenly, you know, went to Utah and bam, and suddenly we're like booking all these trips that we're really, we're really excited about just basically doing beautiful photography by, by being in beautiful places. And that's something that I really, how I really started thinking about it. So after 2016, not that I left behind the other work that was local, but I was really focused on travel and uh, really wanting to kind of be out there and show everybody the beauty of the world, right? And, and this is when I, uh, I joined Instagram. And, you know, joining Instagram really impacted how I approach things. Uh, you know, you could maybe say in some ways negatively because I started feeling a little more self-conscious about how the people saw my work. Uh, and I started really striving for, you know, the, the big epic landscape images that would get, get engagement and be well-received and be dramatic and, and wonderful. Uh, and I had this pressure. I started putting this pressure on myself to kind of be that person, be, be, be that, that person that creates those images and finds a, defines a style that fits that. And my interest really became in wide angle photography. And I'm talking wide angle. I bought a rectilinear wide angle lens that went to 11 millimeters. And you know, half of the stuff in my portfolio was in that 11, 12 millimeter range probably during those years. Um, and I was really kind of motivated to travel and get those images. Like, like it says, you're still chasing sunsets in places that, you know, I've seen most of them that I've seen before. And, 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 you know, again, visiting those places and getting those awesome images and, and highlighting, uh, uh, you know, hopefully getting the exposure and, 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 and highlighting that beauty. It's hard to take a bad picture uh, when you're in Kirkufell, right? I mean, you've seen this composition a million times and everybody does their own take, 
But in a way, there was a beautiful technical challenge to this that I really still enjoyed. Uh, so it, for me, this was, okay, well, not everybody can shoot at 11 millimeters. So I'm gonna go and shoot all these things just a little wider, you know, and, and my lens had this gel holder in the backside. So I was buying, you know, like gel film and I was cutting it into chunks and putting in those holders. So, so that I could do an image like this was shot at 11 millimeters with a 10 stop neutral density on the backside. And again, this, this notion of accomplishing something really uh, epic by, by kind of, you know, winning the battle against technology and, and, and doing something that in some ways kind of unique. But, but ultimately, I mean, we, we love uh, these trips and we still love these trips and we still look forward to these trips. Uh, but I started getting this, this wonder loss that was almost getting to be unhealthy because suddenly, you know, I have a, I have, I have a day job and, and we travel uh, two or three times a year and this is not where I live, right? I, I, don't get to, I don't get to do these wonderful trips to get this kind of panoramic epic shots all the time because I live in Minnesota. So that started to be, to be a little bit of a, of a bummer <laughs> for me mentally because I wanted, to, I wanted to be out there. I wanted to just, you know, how do I do this full time kind of thing? And, and how do I uh, make this something that, um, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I was basically having a problem with the fact that uh, if this is what I wanted to do, that's not how my life was structured. Um, There's another shot that I captured with a tilt shift lens, again, trying to uh, adjust the perspective of the composition and keeping that lighthouse vertical by, by shifting the lens. Um, uh, this was from a New Zealand trip that we went to New Zealand for like 24 nights and we rented a car and we brought our tent and we just drove around New Zealand and camped and it was truly a wonderful experience. So the last trip that happened, this was like a month after we launched the slow photography movement was Utah. And this was like a transitional phase because the slow photography movement thoughts were already in my head, but I was still really starting, I was really starting to suffer from the sense of uh, I'm not doing enough. Uh, you know, I went to Utah for six or seven days and you have this vision that you're going to go to Utah and you've seen all the pictures, right? And you're gonna get, come back to this magnificent portfolio of images and you go and you know, it's, it's stunning and, and it's hard to capture. And it's, it's hard to really, with just a handful of days, you're not gonna come back with this incredible portfolio of images. And, and if you were putting your pre that pressure on yourself to do that, which is what I was doing, I was starting to, to start, I was starting to get disappointed with myself almost and that I, I can tra travel enough, I can shoot enough, I can't get enough, you know? And, that was really what um, uh, what motivated uh, for me um, this the the idea of the slow photography movement. We had I was in this mind frame where you know if we're in the car and there's a beautiful sunset happening and I'm not in the right place, I will get into a bad mood, you know, and my wife would have to deal with that. And you know the the, the fact that. Uh, I was feeling like I, I was not being a good photographer, quote unquote, because I'm not, I'm, I was missing that light and, and so on and so forth. So, like I said, I was, I was, I really needed a change. And in a conversation with my wife, uh, she, at one point she said, you know, what you need to do is maybe some slow photography. And, you know, I was like, what, what do you mean? And we started unpacking that. And, and we started talking about the slow movement in travel and in food and how that changes your perspective on life, right? Um, and in talking about that, I really kind of realized that if I wanted to keep enjoying photography, which is why I started doing it, it, it was a hobby, it's something that I did for fun, and somehow it had snowballed into something that was creating this additional pressure and stress uh, uh, in my life, and I wasn't really enjoying it, I was having some success, but I was having less fun, that I needed uh, uh, a change. So. What I was really seeking were, you know, as I say here, kind of alternatives to, to these mindsets, you know, the, the time scarcity mindset, which I was feeling that I just don't have enough time to do enough photography. And I was feeling in some ways inadequate because you, I would open Instagram and in my head, even if it wasn't real, well, everybody else was doing all this stuff and I, and I had to somehow keep up. Um, and photography really started feeling like a commitment. So I had this fear of missing shots 
as if as if our, as a uh, photography is kind of something external that happened to me right so if i'm in the car and there's a sunset happening i'm like oh how am i missing this i'm such a bad photographer where in reality uh ultimately whether whether you capture something or not that has really nothing to do with skill or commitment to photography so um so generally i had developed a sense of emptiness regarding my work and the sharing of my work because i was I think part of that was also the social media component, uh, where you sh you shared and you know you, you work so hard to get an image captured and processed, and you share it and you ride the high for like a day or a few hours, and then it's like all right now it's time to move on to the next thing, and there's this kind of rat race feeling that I was having that that was kind of getting to be less enjoyable. So. So I'm, I, you know, maybe I will read through this. I won't spend too much time on, on these, but I invite you to visit the website, slowphotographymovement.com. Uh, we, uh, these are our goals that we have. Uh, we started with these goals, we've tweaked them, uh, but really they've stayed uh, very consistent. And one of them is to uh, put focus on the photographic experience. Um, and by that, we mean really kind of Enjoy the experience and, and photography can come along when you want it to come along. And photography is, is a lot more meaningful when you love and enjoy what you're doing. And ultimately, sometimes, you know, and I, I had a hard time wrapping my head around this at first. Sometimes you just want to enjoy the experience and maybe you should and maybe you don't. But if you're in a beautiful place, you don't have to burden yourself with always photographing. Um, the second one is telling engaging stories about the context in which an image was captured. And this is basically from those art show experiences for me, this, this idea that really there's so much more to an image than just whether it's beautiful. And when there's a, a really strong story connected to it and where people really understand more about the context or the way in which it was captured, it's more meaningful and it's, it can really serve as an opportunity for creating connections, which is really, uh, one of the one of the things that we really emphasize, uh, emphasizing quality over quantity. I mean, that was a really big one for me. Um, and also, you know, prioritizing respectful attitudes towards subjects. And this this ties into a lot of other topics like nature first, and you know, all these other efforts to make sure that you know we are valuing what we're shooting, and we're good advocates, and we're not really prioritizing you know a few likes or a bunch of engagement or whatever over uh, the you know well-being of the subject um, in, in nature in this case. And building community. And this was really, for me personally, one of the bigger ones. I felt kind of isolated in photography. I didn't really know many photographers. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, th this notion of creating connections between photographers and, be and between photographers and others is something that was really important to us. So those are our goals. I am not doing this alone. I started when when I started this initiative in 2018, like within the first week or two, you know, well before launching, I started messaging some people uh, whose work I really respected and who I thought would be uh, I would be honored to collaborate with. And I was immensely lucky to have uh, uh, Jennifer Renwick and Beth Young uh, join as 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 collaborators in this. And it's really the three of us that have done this. So even though you know I initiated the idea and I sent the request do you want to do this with me it's really the three of us that have really built this together and this has been a blast and, and we do it for fun and we I'll, I'll get into a little bit of what we do here but there's a three of us in our monthly check-in so you know talk about creating connections now so i have these two wonderful photographers that whose work i love and i'm connecting them on a monthly basis and we're talking about how can we build uh, spm and how can you, how can we use it to build community and to maybe change the culture of photography a little bit in, in ways that, uh, that, you know, relate to our goals. So the website is the home page is a blog. So when you land on the website, you'll, you'll get what the page on the left here and you can scroll down and we just put we try to put up an article every month or two. Um, my nature is to kind of uh, oh, I, I start getting like, oh, we got to do this much. And I, I always need to back, you know, kind of take a bag a notch and remember that I started this because of, I didn't want to get away from the pressure and I don't want to we, pressure myself or my collaborators into, in, into and turn it into stressful. This is 100% for fun. 
Uh, but you know, these articles are on the left, and as you scroll through those, they're all connected to those themes or to those goals that we shared. It's not random content. We really are kind of trying to kind of uh, change or promote a certain way of seeing nature and a certain way of doing photography. Um, we also have social media uh, that we love and hate. Uh, the Instagram is on the right here. Um, but let me say, Instagram has been wonderful for us and, and for me as a way to build community and to get to know people. Uh, our Instagram page has so much wonderful engagement and we have met, I have personally met so many other wonderful photographers through, uh, through that uh, platform that I'm really thankful to everybody who's participated uh, there. Uh, we feature images that use the hashtag and the caption that's relevant to our goal. So we, we don't just put up an image, the image has to have a caption and a story that relates to a slow approach and, and to our goals. And that's really one of the things that we're trying to value is depth and content, okay? It's not just about a pretty picture, it's about a pretty picture that has, uh, that, that, that fits the goals of our, of our, of our initiative. Uh, let me say that we love guest contributions. So if you wanna, you know, one of the things that we love about the website and our platform is that we are bringing many voices out. Um, if you, I think we have what, probably 12, 15 different uh, uh, writers already in our, on our page. If you have um, if something you wanna contribute, contact any of us and we'd love to work with you on getting an article uh, up on our website. Um, we do have several categories that are on the page here on the right, uh, where you can see that any article that goes on the website will belong to one of these categories. And I'm, I'm not going to go, we, if, if anybody has any questions, maybe we can come back to this, but you know, you know, the first two, like the slow approach are basically, you know, thoughts or meditations on what it means to slow down. And, you know, this is open to interpretation and, and there's been quite a few pieces already on that. Uh, capturing context is really about sharing more of the story and context and content, you know, and, and experience behind an image uh, and exposing that and so on and so forth. So we're trying to curate something that's really specific and it's not for everyone, but it's something that we're, you know, we're hoping to, to, to stay on kind of a message and make sure that our, that our website and our whole platform keeps pushing those values and those goals. One of our latest initiatives is the galleries and this has been a real hit. Um, we, we basically started doing a quarterly gallery where anybody can submit their image to be considered to the gallery just by using the hashtag for that quarter. And then we will select 10 to 12 image, uh, gallery uh, images to feature in that quarterly gallery. So this is a screenshot of the some of the images in the, the page of the last gallery. Here's an image from Brenda Petrella and an image from Christopher Warren. Um, uh, Again, we featured some amazing photographers. I love our galleries and, you know, it, it's exposed me to a lot of beautiful work. And it's also allowed me to make connections with, with some really wonderful people. So um, again, something that you might want to consider and the current challenge is energy. So here's the current hashtag and we'll be publishing that gallery in the fall. We've also been doing clubhouse events, uh, kind of like, something like this. I mean, we usually get about 25, 35 people. And, and again, we did this in the spring. We're taking a break for the summer. Uh, summer's, you know, so much going on in the summer. Uh, but basically our goal is every time an article goes up, we're gonna try and have a conversation about it. So again, for depth and content, so you don't just read it, you can have a conversation about it. And we're hoping to have a newsletter coming soon. So that's the slow photography movement. Go to the website, check it out. Um, it's changed my approach to photography completely in so many ways. Um, and part of that is because you have to start practicing what you preach, right? When, you, when you're talking about something and you hear yourself talk, then you realize, okay, am I really doing that? And it's, it's not, it's like an internal process. You don't even realize it, but as you talk more about it, then you, you kind of convince yourself, right? That you have to change your approach. And the other part of that is um, influence. So in building this platform and in building this community and in collaborating with Beth and Jennifer, I can tell you Beth and Jennifer have impacted how I see photography dramatically just in our regular conversations. And so have like all the people that have been uh, regulars in the slow photography movement, uh, social media pages. Um, 
So that exposure and that sense of community has, has really kind of, um, and just seeing all that work has influenced uh, how I do photography. So when I, when I think about how I do it now, it, it's really different. And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm, I've accomplished anything or that I'm better than I was before. It's different. Okay. I do want to make that clear. Um, so one of the, one of the things that I'm prioritizing the experience a lot more, I really am kind of practicing what I've been preaching there in, in the sense that we are, you know, basically most of the times that I go out is with my wife who's not a photographer. We, we go to have fun. We go out to enjoy nature. And really the photography 90% of the time, 95% of the time comes along and I happen to do it if it's there, but I, I, I have not really been forcing photography. I've been getting out to enjoy nature and then bringing photography with me. Uh, and then really kind of shooting what I want and when I want. So I, I will, I will, I, I'm done kind of, uh, you know, shooting something because I think it's going to sell or because it's going to get light. So, or because it's, I got to get up for sunset, um, sunrise. Um, I just shoot what catches my eye and, you know, 90% of it doesn't really make it out of my computer, but some of it does. And, and I think that that's some of the best advice that I've heard is if something makes you stop and it catches your eye, shoot it. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's photography. That that's the creative flow, right? You, you want to photograph what you see. So that you actually have an observation and something that, that you're saying about it instead of like any kind of pre pre-existing, expectations which is my second point here releasing expectations you know often means allowing myself not not to shoot honestly this summer i haven't done much shooting because i've been having a lot of other fun with a lot of other hobbies but i've done some shooting and be, unlike before i'm not stressing out about not being adequate if i stop shooting for a couple of weeks i just say you know that's fine i can do other things um and letting go of, of social media pressures and and kind of Honestly, deprioritizing sales has been one that you think would be easy because, uh, but it's not. But um, honestly, a lot of the work that I shot earlier still ser sells more, right? Because it's Minnesota iconic locations. And you, you know what? Minnesotans love to buy Minnesota iconic locations and they love to license those images. So uh, that's kind of still what I've had most, most, more, most success with. And yet I find myself shooting that a whole lot less nowadays. And I've decided that I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I want to, I want to shoot what I, what I enjoy shooting at the moment. And then a sense of belonging, which is really important because again, all these connections that were made, um, I've, I, I feel like I have a community now and it's centered around SPM. Um, but it's, I've, I've gotten, I've gotten to know, I mean, quote unquote, digitally, right. But a lot of people that I feel like there's a lot of overlap in how we see photography and how we see our approach. So, um, you know, on the screen here is an image that I shot with a telephoto lens um, in the middle of the day when in the past I would have never shot. This was like direct sun. And, but I, I saw the clouds rolling by and these patches of light. And as soon as the, as the cloud covered the background, this was a little island and the clouds covered and darkened the background, that was an opportunity to get this kind of high contrast, right? Um, so those are kind of the, the more, kind of the, the conceptual or more abstract changes, but there's also been like some specific shifts in my interest that are a little more quantifiable. And, and some of those are, I have become more interested in telephoto compositions. Um, smaller scenes, intimate landscape, however term you want, you know, I think those are very popular now, but the, the notion of you are gonna reveal something by framing out more, uh, you know, editing out more of your frame to reveal something that's special, that's more a, a smaller scene. Um, and I've become more interested in, in more, in simpler compositions, more minimalist, if you will, where I'm just kind of isolating a subject. Um, you know, a lot of this influences from, like I said, from some of these other people that I've been collaborating with from and, and Beth and Jennifer and, and others that I've found, but also I think it's natural development because I've done so much wide angle photography that I, I was like, I need, I need to try something else. Um, I've also become more interested in more expressive or abstract images, um, that are maybe less descriptive or recognizable. So a lot of my work now is becoming less of, oh, I know exactly where you took that because I took that shot too. It's becoming a little bit more 
uh, of a moment uh, or, or a detail. And I am getting increasingly fascinated with textures and patterns. I think that's probably where my future work will go more towards. Um, and there's, there's just something very architectural about that, of a texture that really kind of speaks to my interest. Um, uh, lastly, I've become interested in macro again, which is interesting because, you know, there's some things that I filtered out of my work because they were going to be out of brand, right? So if, if I'm going to be an epic, epic vista scene photographer, well, I can't be doing macro or I can't be doing this or that. Um, and it has sold my macro lens. And so I had to buy it again. And then, you know, and during COVID to, to play with it again. And now I'm, I'm into it again because it, it fits the kind of my expanding interest. And I think it's fine because like I said, ultimately what I've come to understand that for me is if I enjoy shooting it at any given moment, that's what I'm going to shoot. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, in brand or out of brand or whatnot. So now I'll share some of the work that's newer that I'm maybe at this moment, more, more of my favorite images, let's say. Um, uh, we, we had a short trip to Banff uh, a couple of years ago. This was like a six day thing. And these are my two favorite images that, that I brought back from that trip. Uh, the one on the left was this kind of playful, that's a focus stack, but it's this playful play on the reflections that were happening uh, again in the middle of the day. Uh, from from the pine trees in the distance, and then using a polarizer to accentuate that, but being able to see through the water and to get that oak contrast in textures. Uh, the one on the right is actually upside down. The one on the left is not upside down, by the way. The one on the right actually is, but the one on the right was, I did get up one morning to shoot a broad sunrise, and I set up, and I shot it, and I was like, nah, not, in, not great. And then I took up my telephoto lens, this one in Lake Louise, and, and I started looking for composition. There was this moment in the water where the reflections were doing something that was, that was really beautiful. I thought it was creating this really wonderful pattern. It was just soft enough to become, uh, you know, uh, a little more artistic or, or uh, dissolved, but where the, where, where the geometric shapes were still really clear. And I, you know, I, I love this image. And it, it, it's something that I wouldn't have even seen, I think, if, it, if before, before we did SPM. We also took a trip to Olympic uh, and Rainier uh, in 2019. This was our last trip before COVID. And once again, coming back from that trip, instead of all these epic vistas, I ended up with what I would describe as, as, as tighter uh, compositions that are a little more exclusive of other things. So like this view, for example, was on top of a lake. And in the past, I would have probably just framed my composition around the lake and that would have been the feature and in this case I decided to actually cut off the lake and, and isolate the kind of the layered uh, the layered elements here dusted with this beautiful snow with, with this kind of front being hit by the sunlight really kind of cut my eye so it cut my eye so I just went for it and I, and I really kind of enjoyed the, the results and there's just again I'm an architect and there's some compositional things that are attractive to me that maybe are a little, uh, you know, uh, different than what some people prefer, but I, I do love some strong symmetry sometimes, some asymmetrical symmetry, if you will, where there's just a strong symmetry to an image and then the smaller things are obviously asymmetrical. Uh, so this was my other favorite shot from that trip to, um, to the Pacific Northwest where I had just come from a wonderful overlook where I didn't get any images and we're driving down and I saw this tree that was starting to be hit by the setting sun uh, through the forest and I was able to kind of get out of the car and, and, and look for an angle where it could be framed really strongly between uh, in a gap in the forest. And, and I got this image that I really love just because there's a, this moment of glow there that really accentuates that. And this is something that I'm kind of leaning into more and just saying, you know what, I'm going to roll with it. I'm going to have all these, I think I'm going to developing a portfolio of a, a lot of these like centered. I, I started a gallery on my website, this guy called Tree Portraits. And I'm going to start doing these, uh, these elements that are a little bit more formal. Uh, here's a similar image of um, a tree that is uh, like a 
seven minute walk from my front door of my house here in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, in, in a little regional park here and Como Park. And I found this tree in, in, in a winter storm. And I mean, I, I love it. And I, I've had very passionate conversations with a couple of people in art shows where it's like, gosh, why did you put it in the middle? And then, you know, it's like, well, you know, I put it in the middle because I won in the middle in this image. And, and, and trust me, I shot it a couple of different ways. Uh, but you know, I love getting, I love hearing what people think about about those things. Um, and again, I, I could keep going with that. I mean, I think I'm, I'm. This is a thing for me. So this was a another shot in the middle of the day, it's like 2 p.m. Uh, in the br blue sky, uh, hot summer, and um, on a day where I wouldn't have expected to do photography, and we're doing this hike and coming out of the hike, I see the shape of this tree. That's completely glowing, just just shining in the sun. And of course I had to use like, I actually ended up to get a little separation here and open the lens and up, I had to get a neutral density filter on it because that, that was blowing out those highlights. Uh, but again, kind of framing tight again uh, in that element, really kind of an, an emphasizing the brightness of that tree uh, really, really kind of worked for me. Um, and the image of the, on the left here is probably my favorite image that I shot last year. And it's such a little detail. Um, it's really a little rock sticking. We're on the side of a creek here. Uh, and there's like thick cover of snow that was starting to melt. And, and the little at the tip of this little rock is kind of peeking through. And just the, the composition of the tying of those lines. Again, this is something that I was shooting with a telephoto lens from like five or six feet away. It's just a small moment. But some of these smaller scenes and uh, that I'm really kind of becoming more more interested in, uh, and again a, a detail of a tree that that I saw the color kind of uh, and the texture of it is really interesting. Another thing that's changed is more handheld images. So before, if I was going to take a photo, it was going to always going to be you know a, five, a, a twenty minute endeavor. By the time that I played with enough, uh, getting the tripod just where I wanted and getting the uh, everything set up and. And, you know, so, and lately I'm allowing myself to shoot handheld. I mean, if, if the light allows it, why not? I have a good, I have a couple of really good stabilized lenses. So the image on the left is, I, I just love that I shot that from a moving canoe uh, while paddling in the boundary water. So, you know, uh, it was a stabilized lens and that was shot at like 300 millimeters and, and you know, it, it worked. It, I, I got a sharp shot, but something that I wouldn't have even, even allowed myself to try in the past. Uh, uh, nowadays, I think I've, I've started to do maybe half of my images that I'm putting out, if not more, are starting to become handheld images sometimes because um, it works sometimes, not for all subjects. But if you had asked me in the past, 100% of my portfolio, maybe 99.9 .9 was on a tripod. And I think that that's uh, a change as well. I've become really interested in tree bark. Uh, that's something that I think is going to be a growing uh, uh part of my portfolio because everywhere I go now I'm shooting tree bark I just I, I'm obsessed with it I think it's stunningly beautiful and this was a morning in the boundary waters I actually wrote an article of this on the slow photography movement website if you want to see a few more of the series but um, I got up that morning to shoot up a landscape a waterscape in the lake I was in the boundary waters and I didn't, couldn't find anything and then I said okay so what's capturing my attention Oh, look at those trees and how the dappled light is just kind of, it was dark in there with some patches of light were falling on them and really accentuating some of the pattern and the color that's starting to come out. So I was really, that's what I shot, you know, and I, and I, I just ran with it. Um, the other thing is when, when you get to know a place well, um, come back to it, you know, so I, I've started to, to try this sometimes. Um, the image on the left is one that I shot and I love. Uh, the image on the right was me uh, seeing those trees being in full bloom and saying, you know what, what if I try that composition uh, now and see what happens? And I, I still prefer the image on the left, but I'm very, very happy with, with that too. And it's kind of a, a good practice to see, um, you know, how something changes with, uh, with the seasons. And I'm hoping to play with that a little more in the future as well. Okay, so this is interesting. I COVID, right? So COVID happens, and I was like in this phase where I was still looking forward uh, to more travel, and found myself locked at home. 
And like a lot of us did, I ended up looking around and you know what we have a lot in our house? House plants. Uh, my wife has over a hundred house plants. She's an enthusiast. And I said at one point, okay, that's what I'm shooting. So remember how I started, I had done some portraits in the, those black and white portraits of friends in like 2016. I said, well, okay, so can I apply that? So I brought out my, all my remote flash units and my, I set them up as slaves and my diffusers and I had an umbrella and a softbox and a little hair light, <laughs> a little hair light. Uh, and I started playing with that and house plans. And I got some images that and I was trying to get really, really excited about, including something like this where it, it, it becomes so layered and kind of abstracted. And, you know, not a leaf was hurt, by the way. You know, this would, I would not be allowed. So this was carefully kind of placing the leaves of this pilea in a way that they kind of face towards me and, and, and just crafting that composition and getting the light just right. So that's something that, I started doing because of COVID, but I'm going to keep doing because it's a lot of fun. Uh, and this is not a macro shot, by the way. This is shot with a telephoto lens. Uh, I mean, that's probably like a 10 inch uh, scene. Um, the one on the left, same thing uh, with, with the Monstera Adansoni, if I got that right. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so that's, that's something that I started having a lot of fun with. And then on the right was getting back into macro. So that's a, this is a tiny little African viola that, you know, that flower is probably three quarters of an inch. I mean, this is really, really in there uh, uh, as a macro shot, but I was trying to play with that and trying to use some of the compositional um, preferences or techniques that I've been developing and, and applying those to macro photography. So the image on the left um, is a crab apple uh, that's starting to leaf out and bloom in the spring here in Minnesota. And I shot that. I have a blog post actually of that, but I shot that with a reflector. So I'm holding a golden reflector on my left hand and, and then kind of zooming in uh, with a stabilized micro lens on my right hand to get this kind of glowing effect uh, to happen. And, you know, we've also started a pollinator garden in our backyard. And I started chasing some bees around with, uh, and this is actually a hoverfly um, uh, with my macro lens and trying to get us, uh, you know, a good shot of them sitting on a flower. And again, as you see, like the, the tendency or interest in more minimal compositions, like if I do it, I, I'm trying to get rid of the background or blur it all together into something homogenous, right? Uh, so here I really needed, wanted to get in there. So I didn't get the, pro, the, the, the perimeter of the flower so I could get kind of a simpler composition uh, uh, frame. So that's kind of what I've been doing the most of, but I wanted to take a pause here and say, um, th this renewed interest in tighter compositions and telephoto and, and a longer macro focal lens um, is not to say that I'm not interested in wide angle anymore. In fact, I could imagine myself diving back deep into that uh, again at some point, I think, I've been influenced by a lot of other voices in, in my, in, in interesting me in some of these other kind of tighter scenes. Um, but I think that it would be a misconception to describe wide angle photography as something that is just easy or, uh, or um, you know, less creative. Uh, I think that a lot of, uh, I've, heard, I've heard some people describe it as it's easy to show up with a wide angle list and you can include everything in shot, right? But in some ways, it's harder to do wide angle photography in a way that doesn't include a lot of distractions and that, you know, it's, it's harder to get a, a, a strong composition with a wide angle lens that doesn't have a lot of distracting elements. And I am still very interested in it. Um, and this was a photo that uh, on the left is a photo that I shot just a few months ago when it was still winter in Minnesota, because we have long winters. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to highlight that because that is a very famous beach here, uh, Pebble Beach and Split Rock Lighthouse State Park. And that's a wide angle lens and that's a wide angle shot, shot at 11 millimeters. But does other, do other people have the same shot? Probably not because I found something 
really tiny and unique in the landscape, which is like, you can see this red circle, it's like an eight inch pebble, right? So this, this element in the foreground is just a tiny little piece that you, most, you know, you would miss unless you're really kind of crawling around like I was looking for subjects. So, I mean, there's plenty of ways to do wide angle photography and, 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 and you know, be creative and be unique and do things that are different. And I, I'm still very interested in it. Uh, the image on the right too. So there, here's me shooting this image. You can see that this, uh, you know, this looks like an epic landscape. That's really a hole. It's about two feet wide uh, that I'm that I'm framing with 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 a wide angle lens to get this kind of dramatic perspective. Uh, so that's something that I am still very interested in. Um, I wanted to wrap this up to you know by saying i don't i haven't been shooting much this summer and i i tend to slow down in summers a little bit but uh we have a we have a boat in bayfield wisconsin and we spend a lot of time up there and i've been taking my camera with me uh and not doing a lot of photography but you know i've been playing with reflections so what you see on the screen here is just kind of a collection of unedited shots that i took from my lightroom catalog um, and just to show you stuff that's kind of in the works that I might or might not use, but it's something that some of the images that might be upcoming. And be, again, really interested in, in in kind of the details of a sunset and how that's framed. Uh, I've been kind of fascinated by sailboat mass reflections and I'm, I'm kind of hoping to develop a series there. You can see on the top left, some of those bark images. I mean, these are really, most of these trees are uh, within a block or two of my house, I, you know, if, if it's wet, if it's rained, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to take a walk and I'm going to look for those textures and those patterns. And especially when the moss comes alive, I mean, like, like, you know, this half and half, I mean, I, I love that stuff. Uh, again, simple compositions and things that are really kind of impactful. Um, and then the bottom was, I think a month and a half ago or so, my, my, um, there was a family event in Colorado and we got to go into Rocky Mountain National Park. I've never been there before. So we got to go into the park a couple of days. And, you know, these are probably some of the shells that I think have the most potential that I might might end up using. And as you can see, it's mostly has some ref, kind of abstracted reflections and some texture details and reflections and you know more tree bark. Uh, and I'm really excited about this image on the bottom right. Uh, this tree had like this half green, half burnt uh, color and trying to isolate it with a really soft foreground and background in a way that I think is going to really kind of keep building on that series that I was showing earlier um, that I'm really excited about. So that's kind of what I might be editing soon, I think. And I think that's where I'm going to leave it for now and open it up. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I'm going to get you to um, take down your screen. And guys, if you have any questions, this is a good time to throw them in the chat for Ernesto. Um, I'm seeing one question in there so far, and it's from Egidio. And his question is, how much post-processing time do you spend on average in some of the images you showed us tonight? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a great question. I, I didn't touch on that um, as I went through the presentation because, uh, but, I, but I could have, because that's something that's also been changing dramatically. Uh, in those phases of development. Um, I, I, you know, in phase one, I was probably spending a couple hours on an image uh, as I was like often uh, bracketing and blending exposures and, and doing uh, a lot of it post-processing. Um, in this most recent phase, um, I, uh, I have been Here's the deal. I, I love photography. I love to be out in nature. I love to the experience. Uh, processing, I have a love-hate relationship with. I, I don't often motivate myself to go to the room and kind of work on the computer because my day job is computer-based, um, my architecture job. Yeah. So, you know, on a, on a good image, I mean, I still, I sell my images. I sell large versions of them. So I do have to go and make sure that I have dust spots so I don't have any errors or mistakes. You know, I have, I work with some of our consultants to license images, but on the, you know, on the average, I think most processing of an image now happens within an hour. I think it's probably about an hour. I will do some adjustments in Lightroom. If the image has to go to Photoshop, I take it to Photoshop for 
uh, usually some dodging and burning. And then I'll come back to Lightroom for some final tweaks and exporting. And, you know, I think on a, you know, on an hour is probably an average. Um, there's some images that are still, you know, I still do, I didn't show many, but I, if I feel like it, I'll sometimes do a night shot. It's not my thing, but I do, I do have some Milky Way shots. Those are going to take me a while <laughs> um, because I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have to blend exposures and do all that work. Um, so. So as I'm floating through here, there are no questions, which surprises me guys, but there are so many wonderful comments. And um, basically you've hit, you've hit some points home with a lot of people. And what, what I'm, I'm gonna read just a couple of them for you or to you, because I, I just think that this, this is, when I started this project, you know, I wanted to learn stuff, but I also wanted people to come in and inspire me. And your entire presentation did that for me. And as I'm looking and I'm scrolling through these comments, which I will share with you, um, I'm just, I'm tickled to see that I'm not the only one that you've made an impression on tonight. So um, Peter says, this whole, this thing really strikes a chord with me right now as he finds it so interesting. Um, Brie is saying she's love, she loves seeing that your journey and how your photography has moved to images that you are, that are more authentic for you. And Jidio is saying proof that there is really no bad light. And one of the comments in here is from Rose. And I'm, this is a challenge from, from, Ernesto and me, Rose, she made a comment about the, piece of, the images of the bark. And she says that she has a lot of her own images or bark. So I hope, and she's never shared them. So I'm hoping that um, just listening to you talk and, and seeing the beauty and the simple subjects of tree bark, that she'll be motivated to share those images tomorrow, Rose. We challenge you to do it tomorrow. So Ernesto, from me to you, thank you so much for coming and sharing what you know and um, defining a little bit about what the slow photography movement is. And I think a lot of the people in this room may not realize it. They may be doing similar type of work. They just didn't have a name for it. And so I, I hope that, that this you know, kind of validates you know, some of the things they're doing and that it will encourage them to go and look and, and, and find out more about it. So with that, I'm going to thank you so much for being here. Is there anything that you want to close with before I sh um, uh, close out your session tonight? Well, I, I'll just say thank you so much for listening to me and for having me. And, you know, if I, I'd love to get to know you also, you know, please connect with me. Um, I, that, that's what really what I enjoy the most is making connections. So. Well, and we're going to invite you to come and join us anytime. We're here on Wednesday night. So please feel free to, to jump in um, if you see a topic that, that interests you. Guys, you can connect with Ernesto through his website, ErnestoRuizPhotography.com. And if you're on Instagram, look for him at Ernesto underscore Ruiz underscore photography. And you can find you can also find more information and a lot of well-written articles at slowphotographymovement.com. Next week, nature and wildlife photographer, Ruth Hoyt will be here to present perspective and practice. Ruth will share her knowledge about how perspective affects photographs and that certain practices can take your work to the next level. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon. Mm -hmm.